Few games will ever attain the status of good, and even fewer will ever be considered great. And as for GOAT status, that's a moniker reserved for the absolute diamonds of the pack. I don't want to waste time, so this video is not going to be about what I believe is the greatest game of all time, as honestly, there's too many to count. There's also been too many people who've done that specific video way too many times. There's even been videos regarding comparisons between the very games I'm going to speak on today. However, that's usually in a more trivial way regarding graphics and other unnecessary things that should be compared. I'm going to be breaking down each game's story and picking the game I believe to be the superior one. Now inherently, comparing a relatively linear single player story game with an RPG is automatically a hard thing to do. The games from a technical perspective are very different in terms of how the gameplay actually works. And it's why I'm only sticking to one very specific element for each game. Before I even begin, I want to make it absolutely clear that when dealing with any form of art, there's no real thing such as objectivity. Each game is its own respective realization of a sea of creators' visions and technically, one cannot be better than the other. I respect the devs, writers, animators, artists, and voice actors of each game. But with that being said, let's get to it. We'll start with Red Dead Redemption 2. Now this is coming from someone who's never played the first and only recently finished the second, I hold this game in a very high regard. The story is not just a narrative but feels more like a legitimate experience. You're experiencing one of the greatest stories in history and being able to actually navigate that experience is one of the best opportunities I've had playing a game. The game also struck a nerve with me as did Cyberpunk, and I'm assuming it stuck with a lot of people as well considering the general consensus around the game. Red Dead 2 is exactly what the full title entails, Redemption. You play as a member of the Vanderlyn gang named Arthur Morgan, and for lack of a better phrase, Arthur is not a good man. At least not when we meet him. There's something to be said about how unequivocal the title of the game is. We're told before we even play the game what the theme will be, what the end goal is. I enjoy the fact that while we know the end goal, we get to take solace in being able to take that journey and guide these characters, and before you rush to the comments about the low honor ending, I don't find it to be the canon ending. I mean, in a realistic world, the low honor ending is probably the right one, but for what Rockstar is attempting to do with this story, high honor all day. Arthur's a man that's sort of trapped in a sense. He joined the gang at 14 and truthfully, he was doomed from the start considering what the man who raised him would go on to become, which brings me to Dutch. Dutch is one of, and I mean this in the most sincere way possible, the greatest antagonists ever. Not in video games, ever. Plain and simple. I would imagine most of you who clicked on this video have some idea of what happens, but spoilers for those who don't, witnessing Dutch's downfall is akin to that of a wreck from a distance. You see it coming, but with all of your power, you cannot look away. He starts off as this man that seems all-knowing and safe and our protector, but that aura of trustworthiness begins to crack. He begins acting recklessly and thinks less for his family and more for himself. I have a plan, while basically a meme of Dutch at this point, is one of the most memorable lines in the game. Dutch is constantly that one person that is consistently trying to cut corners and circumvent a process rather than dealing with an issue head-on and we all know this kind of person. We see the kind of man he is. I feel it was a bit intentional to give off that vibe during the early parts of the game, but because he's already presented as the leader and we, Arthur, have respect for him, you try to almost ignore that? Again, we see it coming, we just don't want to look away. Or maybe we just don't want to believe it? At the final parts of the game, losing Dutch is legitimately heartbreaking. Seeing him side with Micah and constantly make decisions that just hurt the gang members in and out time and time again is a gut-wrenching experience. However, I feel like I went on a bit of a tangent about Dutch. I could go on and on about him as a character, and I probably will, but that's for another time. I want to shift the focus back to Arthur. Arthur Morgan, simply put, is one of my favorite characters ever. Movie, book, show, play, you name it. He's stoically violent, yet this amazingly contrast with his selflessness and genuine care is one of the reasons he's such a good character. Simply put, he's a very complex man. Most standout characters stand out because of a specific trait. They're funny or intelligent or strong or brave and so on. Arthur Morgan's complexity as a character is a standout in this game because of how scarily human it is. And that's what makes a great character, how believable they are to the audience, but more importantly, how they evolve over the course of a story. Give me bricks. I think it's best for both of us if we pretend this never happened. Well, I agree. You saved my life. You're a good man, and I, uh... Here. You want a pen? It's one of them steel ones. Oh. That's very kind of you. <laughs> but I'm not a good man, Jimmy Brooks. Not usually. You see... I was in Blackwater. 
I kill people. And maybe I should have killed you. Should I have killed you, Jimmy Brooks? Me? I never saw you. Not, not now, not, not never. I think we have an understanding? Of course we do. Jimmy Brooks. <laughs> I will remember that. I've got a good memory. Here we see Arthur, while a kind-hearted man to his friends, is a ruthless, unstoppable, terrifying force to his enemies. Having been with Dutch for so long, he's one of his greatest weapons. And it's honestly what Arthur thinks of himself. A bad man who just does bad shit. He's always thought this about himself given that's what he's grown up with. He knows what he's doing is wrong, justifying it to himself that what he does is for the betterment of the gang. And these actions come to a head when he meets the Downs family. <sighs> You borrowed money from my business partner, Herr Strauss. You owe him, you took the money. He wants it back, what's not to understand? <laughs> Where's our money? I don't have it. That cough. These two seemingly insignificant seconds sealed Arthur's fate forever. The irony isn't lost on me, nor should it be lost on any player, that the very wrongdoings Arthur has done all his life is the very literal thing that gets him killed in the end. Arthur's story, for me at least, begins here. While he doesn't begin making any drastic changes, as he doesn't know what just happened, it does serve as a starting point for a lot of things that happen going forward. Arthur has no problem helping the gang pull off certain jobs, but for us the player as well as Arthur himself, collecting the debts begins to weigh on us. And in some cases, a bit too heavily. I nearly paid off what was owed. Your husband knew the rules when he took that money. Now, I'm real sorry about the way things turned out, but he had a choice. Ain't my fault about the way the world is. He didn't have a choice. He was good and he did good. There wasn't no choice in that. And you've as good as killed him yourself, and don't kid yourself. You had a choice. You speak as if killing was something I cared about. You ever wonder about eternity? You should. I hope it's hot and terrible, Mrs. Downs. Otherwise, I'll feel I've been sold a false bill of goods. Now, please, give me that money. <sighs> Either you got a lazy eye or lack of respect. Which is it, boy? I ain't got no lazy eye. No respect for the likes of you. Well, maybe when your mother's finished mourning your father, I'll keep her in black, on your behalf. You think on that, boy? Well, maybe you shall, sir. And maybe other events will transpire. You best stick to them books, because mark my words on this. Vengeance is an idiot's game. Ah, oh, Mrs. Downs, thank you for your punctuality. It's next to godliness, isn't it? That's cleanliness. I'll have to take your word on that. Good day. I honestly really enjoyed this specific Downs family mission. It's not the first nor last, but arguably the most important. Arthur is still the cold-hearted man that they had the displeasure of meeting before, but now, Arthur's very clearly beginning to grow tired of Dutch and his vengeance with the O'Driscolls and voices to Archie what he's afraid of voicing to someone he considers his father. That vengeance is a fool's game. Ultimately, Dutch's goal in the literal sense seemed to be escaping the country with enough money to fund the gang somewhere safe. However, he's constantly sidetracked because of his problems with a specific group of people, his desire for vengeance, his desire for money, his desire for more. The constant steps back for the gang come as a result usually because of these reasons. And in the end, Dutch doesn't care for actually getting the gang to safety. This is because safety means security. Security breeds creativity, creativity breeds curiosity. And should any of the gang gain any sort of agency over themselves, Dutch almost always sees it as an act of betrayal. Dutch needs the gang for his ego. He needs to control them to feel worthy of something. His need for control time and time again gets his supposed family killed. After each job, each scheme, each con, each plan, Dutch puts the gang in a worse position than they were before. In truth, this game seems almost as much about Dutch as it is about Arthur. He begins the game as someone that is quite literally an entirely different being than the man we know by the end of the game. I'm not here to rehash the story because that's been done, nor am I trying to say anything that hasn't already been said to some extent, but analyzing this story is null and void without mentioning Dutch's character arc. It would also be entirely pointless without touching on the greatest singular scene in any video game. Just for some context before playing the scene, I have never cried during a game, nor movie, or show. I'm just not necessarily someone who's that emotional. However, I do find myself invested in a lot of characters and what they have to say about their lives and overall situations they can find themselves in. As I'm sure most of us can agree, we care so much because we can find ourselves in these characters. That being said, let me stop yapping and roll the clip. 
What's wrong? I'm, uh, uh, I'm dying, sister. Okay. Yeah, I got TB. I got it. Beating the man to death <clears throat> for a few bucks. <sighs> I've lived a bad life, sister. We've all lived bad lives, Mr. Morgan. We all sin. But I know you. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> Forgive me, but that's the problem. You don't know you. What do you mean? I don't know, but whenever we happen to meet, you're always helping people and smiling. I had a son. He passed away. I had a girl who loved me. I threw that away. My mama died when I was a kid. And my daddy... Well, I watched him die. And it weren't soon enough. My husband died a long time ago. Life is full of pain. But there is also love and beauty. Uh, what am I gonna do now? Be grateful that for the first time, you see your life clearly. <laughs> sure. Perhaps you could help somebody. Helping makes you really happy. <sighs> I still don't believe in nothing. <laughs> Often, neither do I. <laughs> but then, I meet someone like you, and everything makes sense. <laughs> You're too smart for me, sister. <sighs> I guess I... I'm afraid. There is nothing to be afraid of, Mr. Morgan. Take a gamble that love exists and do a loving act. All aboard! Yeah, all sense of self-control went out the window when I hit this part of the game. I had the luck of being able to share this experience with my audience over on TikTok Live and let me say I was barely able to hold back tears. I ended up turning off the stream and truthfully just pondering the entire monologue. I pondered my actions and words with others. I pondered my future and my fears. I wondered what I would do in Arthur's situation. And speaking honestly, I am afraid. Whether that's a failing at being a creator, failing to entertain and provide amusement, failing to provide in my relationship, and a whole host of real fears, but more importantly, like Arthur, failing to provide the world with at least a percentage of good before kicking the bucket. In a weird way, this felt like Arthur's climax. You hear him constantly tell his friends and strangers he's okay, but for him to finally acknowledge his mortality and fears felt like a weight lifted off of even my shoulders. And in the end, Arthur does finally come to terms with himself and what he's done. He's sick. He's dying. He's talking crazy. I gave you all I had. I did. I interpret this scene as two things, plain and simple. Arthur gave Dutch chance after chance and benefit of the doubt on more occasions than I wanted the story to allow for. However, he continuously had Dutch's back, even when Dutch didn't have his. The man is the fucking textbook definition of loyal until the very end. Then there's the other side. Arthur's talking with himself, God, whoever's willing to listen. He gave all he had to right his sins, and for better or worse, it cost him his life, and honestly, who knows if it truly did make things right. Arthur's story is that of an interesting one, and a full look at his story in life is for another time as we look to its competition today with one of my favorite games of all time, Cyberpunk 2077. Wow, Cyberpunk 2077, the game that is probably the very reason you're even watching this video. The game that made me develop this very niche, cool, and interesting community. It came out during an interesting time for me. The big P lockdown, or any special way you want to refer to it, was a difficult time for most, to be honest. I was extremely bored home all the time in high school and was tired of constantly playing Warzone, so I tried something new for once, and from the very beginning, I was hooked. This world and its inner workings zapped my attention away, and I was enthralled. 
the aesthetic, the colors, the cars, the lingo, the mechanics, and most importantly, the story. Cyberpunk's story is almost entirely unrivaled, and I've been wanting to make this video, but I had a hard time coming up with a way to attack this specific analysis because of the effect it's had on me. Because of the journey V is faced with, the story felt incredibly human. V loses one of their only friends and is forced to go on the greatest journey of probably any legend in Night City. Having that looming clock over your head, from a narrative perspective at least, does fill the story with a sense of dread. As the story goes on, certain points do a very good job of reminding you that you are dying. In this world where everything you do matters until it doesn't, having that fire under your ass to make something happen is such a beautiful reflection of the real world. Cyberpunk as a genre, not a game, is inherently political, so the game does touch on a lot of important things. I really don't care for all the comments regarding politics in games, but by all means, type to your heart's content. In the real world within the context of its own world. As for what I meant by your actions having meaning until they don't, the very idea of success in Cyberpunk is by dying. As a mercenary, it's put into the player's head that no matter what you've done, you'll never obtain that legendary status. You'll never be a good merc, you'll never be one of the greats, and you sure as shit will never be a Night City legend. This is the precedent set, this is the goal we wish to achieve as a player in Night City. However, on a much more real note, I do believe this planted the idea of being a creator in my head. To be able to be so good at something and have your actions be remembered as legend is something I do genuinely want to achieve. Cyberpunk is about legacy as much as it is about living your life. The very standout theme and goal is what slash how will your actions define your legacy and honestly, to have that be woven into a game of the RPG genre is very clever. There's a balance you need to find in life and that is finding the difference between what you want your legacy to be, how you want to live your life, and when to learn how to differentiate one from the other. V very much wants to fulfill Jackie's dream of being a legend in his honor but at the same time, they're literally fighting for their lives. They want to continue living despite the fact that dying fruitfully would be the only way to honor Jackie's wishes. And to me, it's such an interesting paradox. I also do enjoy that because V's actual desires are left vague as a result of it being an RPG, you can draw conclusions like this. It's also very controversial of me to say, but there's something that deeply moved me when I played Phantom Liberty, as well as a specific ending of that expansion. I've already made an entire video regarding that ending and why I think it's the only happy one, despite the sentiment that there are no happy endings in that city, and it did relatively well. All this to say, the ending was absolutely the most incredible way to tie the dilemmas V has together. V's life as a merc is over with the tower ending of Phantom Liberty. They're unable to use implants in a world where implants are absolute essentials, but they're cured of what was killing them and can no longer become a legend. However, they already are. For all intents and purposes, V is already dead. The life they knew was gone, but their actions remain. All their gigs done and jobs completed. They achieve Jackie's dream and even Rogue confirms this during the ending voicemails. On the other hand, V is free now. They can become whatever it is they want with their new life. They got to essentially have their cake and eat it too. They're free from the expectations and bindings of what their society wants them to be and can now be whatever they need. In some cases, I do envy that and the carelessness they're allowed to have. For me, I understand I don't have an expectation to be great. I don't have anything binding me to someone's idea of what I'm meant to be, but I do have a goal and something I owe myself. I enjoy the ending of the game, but it did help me understand I owe it to myself to become great and undeniable. That being said, both Cyberpunk 2077 and Red Dead 2 managed to display that video games with regard to storytelling capabilities should not be fucked with. I cannot emphasize this enough, but video games have always had an advantage in telling a narrative. The audience, or player, has direct influence over the story they're experiencing, especially if it's a game that has choices. However, while I love both games and will keep both games very close to my heart, I can't keep playing the middle ground. You guys came for a winner, and if I had to pick, gun to my head, no other choice, I'd have to choose Red Dead Redemption 2. When I finished the section of Red Dead Redemption 2 while writing this script, I left a few things out because I knew it would win. Arthur's I'm afraid line is the most bone chilling line ever delivered in a game. After so long of trying to convince others and more importantly himself that he wasn't, it was nice to hear him just say it. As a person, it's hard to admit your fears and as a man at the time, as well as a man of Arthur's reputation, I'd imagine it's even harder. It was such a perfect moment of growth for Arthur that felt earned and almost like this building pressure had finally popped. Earlier, I left off talking about Arthur and him telling Dutch he had given him his all and that ending really stuck with me. A lot of the game stuck with me honestly, but that specific line especially. Arthur gave Dutch his life and loyalty. After his conversation with the nun, Arthur understood he could not continue living his life the way he had. He had to find something to believe in and took that gamble on love. On the basis that love truly exists. He loved Dutch for the man he was and for the man that raised him. Arthur gave all he had to his father and in return, 
got his redemption. And that's another thing about this game. Whether we allow it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether the characters in the game both ally and foe to Arthur Morgan believe it or not, Arthur got his redemption. Not because he did enough good deeds, donated enough money, or helped enough people to wash away his sins. He got his redemption because he believed he did enough. Arthur admits to himself in the end that he tried. And for most, that's enough. It should be enough. As long as we're trying to be better and do better by ourselves and other people, we need to allow ourselves our own redemption. Blaming ourselves and being hard on ourselves isn't really helpful to anyone. You take responsibility, move forward, and be better. Arthur believing in love died a man redeemed. There's no way to measure his good deeds to his sins and see which outweighs the other because in reality, there's no point. He tried and in his case, as well as most, that's enough. Red Dead 2 understands storytelling better than most and this theme was woven into the fabric of this game beautifully. As for Cyberpunk, don't consider it a knock on the game. It's a wonderful game with a powerful message and at the end of the day, this is just my opinion. Clearly there are some very talented writers at both CD Projekt Red and Rockstar who could write absolute circles around me and most people watching this video. However, I want to hear your guys' thoughts. I haven't seen anyone compare these stories, so I wonder if anyone thinks about them like I do. Let's be respectful, of course, as discussing anything video game related can get messy. Subscribe, like, share, all the fun stuff. We're close to YouTube partner, and I can't wait to celebrate that with you guys. Take care, stay safe, have a good one.